Hello, friends. Good morning, welcome. Uh, my name is Zane Bitter. I'm one of the uh, core developers of Heat and a former PTL. Uh, my co conspirators this morning uh, Renak Akmarov from uh, Nokia, he's the PTL of Mistral, and Phelan Wang from Catalyst, he's the PTL of Zakar. Uh, and we're here to talk to you today about uh, how to build a self healing application with Aid, Zakar, and Mistral. Um, there will be a live demo at the end of the session, so if anyone kind of came with the, the hopes of seeing the live demo crash and burn, um, <laughs> you'll have to wait for the end of the session, I'm sorry, but uh, stay tuned because I think we've got some good stuff for you in the meantime. Um, also, if anyone in the audience has a dead chicken, could you please come see us up front? Um, <laughs> so these guys are going to talk to you a bit about uh, what Aids, Zakar, and Mistral are. Um, but uh, the one word answer is they're the alarming uh, messaging and uh, workflow services for OpenStack. Uh, but I'll let them fill you in with some more details. Um, but before then, I wanted to talk to you all about uh, kind of the big picture here and why um, what we've done in, this, in the Newton cycle is uh, built some integration between uh, Zakar and Mistral. Uh, so I wrote the spec for that with Fei Long and, and Renat, uh, and Fei Long and Tom Ahave from my team at Red Hat, uh, who's former Heat PTL as well, um, implemented it. Um, and we think this is a big deal, and we want to tell you about why. Um, so to do that, I'm going to start at the beginning by answering the big questions. Why are we here? I'm going to limit myself, myself to why are we here at the OpenStack Summit. Um, what, are, what are clouds? Um, I'm sure all of you working on OpenStack have had the experience of trying to explain what OpenStack is to a layperson. Um, one time I had to try to explain it to an economist, which led me to, to start thinking about how, how can we explain uh, OpenStack and cloud in economics terms. Um, and the answer I came up with was it's, it's kind of the culmination of a, or culmination so far of a trend to reduce transaction costs um, that that uh, prevent us from, transaction costs prevent us from uh, utilizing our resources efficiently, basically. Um, so if you cast your mind back to the bad old days of uh, when you had to buy physical service to run your application on, uh, you want to do a new application, the first thing you do is you, you called up your, your server vendor and you said, hey, I need some servers. Uh, and he was like, sure, uh, we can build those for you and take a couple of weeks and then we'll put them on a truck and ship them out to you. Uh, or really need to purchase order. You'd be like, sure. I'll fax that right over to you. It's primitive stuff. <laughs> and, and once the servers finally arrived on a truck, you know, your, your IT department would have to rack them, hook them up to the network, and so on. And finally, you could deploy your application. Um, and, and this whole process could take, you know, a month if you're lucky. Um, so, the result of that was you bought a lot more servers than you needed, uh, you bought them a lot earlier than you needed them, uh, because otherwise you were going to end up, uh, you know, if you had a load spike or something, you couldn't handle it because you, your whole feedback loop here is a month long. Um, and the thing that really changed this in the industry was virtualization. Um, so with virtualization, you, your developer can go into your ticket tracking system, um, I was going to put an open source project logo here, but let's face it, it's probably Jira. Um, open a ticket with your IT department and say, hey, I need a server. Uh, your IT department could, could go into over it because open source, yes. Provision your server, send it back, give it to the developer. Success, right? We've reduced the fever. We've taken the, the really slow things like trucks out of the loop. Um, and we've reduced it down to, you know, this, this could easily happen in one day. Uh, so where before it took a month, and you might, you might go through that process once every six months, uh, here it takes a day, and, and you might go through it every few weeks. Um, so that's great. Um, but we still have a problem here. We still have a person in the loop. Um, and that's slowing things down more than it needs to. Uh, and that's where OpenStack kind of comes into the picture. One day I'll figure out which direction is which on this click. Um, so with OpenStack, it becomes self-service, right? So your developer can go to OpenStack, say, get me a VM, 
and I'll just take the returner, and you've got it straight away. There's no waiting. Uh, and you can easily do this 20 times a day without a second thought. Um, so that's great. Success, right? We took the developer out of the loop. Sorry, we took the person out of the loop. Or did we? Because um, I still see one there. there. There is a big loop, and there is a developer sitting there. Um, so you, you may have noticed that I did not put a title on this slide. Um, I think a lot of people would, would say, this is cloud. We, we've got OpenStack. We're running cloud, right? Um, to me, that's not, not really the case. Like, if you put this out, uh, up as a service on the internet and, and said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a cloud, people would kind of laugh at you a little bit. Like, this is not comparable to AWS or Azure or, or uh, Google Compute Engine. Um, it's, it's more comparable to a VPS hosting service like um, DigitalOcean or something like that. Um, it, it, it's great. It's better than, than the non-self-service version. Um, but it's not really a cloud, uh, to my way of thinking. Um, so everyone's entitled to their own definition of cloud, but my, my working, um, working hypothesis, which I, I'm sharing with you today, is, is this. Cloud is when the application itself is managing its infrastructure. Uh, so the developer might in initially deploy the application, um, but once it's deployed, uh, the application itself decides when it needs more servers. Um, it decides when it needs less servers. It decides when a server has died and it needs to be replaced. Uh, and all this stuff can happen autonomously, not only during the eight hours of the day when you have a developer sitting in front of Horizon clicking on it. Um, so th th that's my working definition of, definition of a cloud. Um, and the key thing about this is that you really, really, really want this to be open source. Because we saw your application is now uh, relying on the cloud APIs. They're, it's part of the platform against which your application is running. Uh, so we saw in the 90s like what happens when you rewrite your application against the proprietary APIs. Um, you don't want to go back to that. Um, so I, I think it's really critical that, that I, I think OpenStack is the only project that can be this thing right now. Um, so I think it's really critical that we support this OpenStack um, and that it, uh, we give people the option to, to write autonomous applications against open source clouds. Um, and by the way, if you're, if you're a higher achiever, uh, you can replace the developer in this with a uh, continuous delivery uh, workflow. So uh, that's the Jenkins logo there. You can have Jenkins deploying to OpenStack. Uh, there's a couple of other options. Um, Zool is what the um, OpenStack infra team has written. Um, that, that is also a good way to do continuous delivery. Um, there's also the Solon project in OpenStack uh, is also aiming at the same kind of thing. So that's kind of the, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, the, the two challenges with this for um, having your application talk to the, and by the way, by application here, I mean uh, not necessarily just code running on a Nova server or on a container or whatever. Um, it's, it's also cloud services like Aid and, and Zakar and what have you are, become part of the application. So your application is basically, could be defined by, say, a heat template uh, rather than think of it as a software package. Um, so the two big challenges here are uh, when the cloud is talking to your application, um, we need that to be asynchronous because the cloud can't wait for your application. Um, uh, the cloud has to be, because we made it self-service, the cloud has to be multi-tenant. Um, so uh, it, it can't block on any one tenant. Uh, and that communication has to be reliable um, because you don't, uh, you know, you don't ever want to lose a message. Uh, and Zakara is the answer to this because it is an asynchronous queue that uh, with reliable delivery uh, for OpenStack. So uh, that's that problem solved. Uh, the other half problem is uh, you want uh, 
to uh, have all your calls authenticated, of course, and, and you want to lock down the authorization to only the things that you need to do. And there's kind of two parts to this. Uh, one is when it's the OpenStack services talking to each other on your behalf, uh, and we're using Keystone Trusts for that. Uh, and the other half is when you have uh, code actually running on another server or in a container or whatever, um, and that has to call the OpenStack APIs. And that has been historically a bit of a problem because we don't really have a good way of uh, creating credentials for a Nova server and locking them down to only the APIs we want them to access. Um, so that work is kind of ongoing. Um, we're hoping to um, push that in. But um, I was, when I made the slide, I was planning to tell you all that that was kind of still a work in progress and we had to wait for that. But, uh, in the process of doing this talk, I, I realized that we've actually solved this problem as well with the Zakarmistra integration, so I'll talk about that in a moment. So here's what we're trying to build, uh, or in fact what we have built. And, and basically, so Zakar is in the center there, uh, and it's kind of the hub. So we've got uh, messages going through Zakar, and there are various sources of messages, and there are various sinks where the messages can go. Um, so, uh, for example, a lot, of, um, a lot of projects, well, not a lot of projects, but um, Heat, for example, is able to send uh, Zakar notifications on certain events, like when you hit um, uh, resource uh, hooks. So you, you can set a hook in your Heat template saying, uh, break before this resource is created or updated. Um, and you can send a, a Zakar message at that point. Um, there's also um, via Solometa and Aid um, Oslo notifications. Um, you can trigger alarms off Oslo notifications. Um, uh, they're called event alarms in Aid. Um, there are, of course, other types of alarms um, from Aid that, based on whatever data Solometa is collected. Uh, and so these can all um, target the car as a, as a, uh, as a message um, queue and you can pump messages into there. Uh, the application can also send messages to Zakar. Um, and in fact, as I was mentioning before about the, the authentication, uh, there are pre-signed uh, URLs in Zakar. So you can give your application code running on another server a pre-signed um, Zakar URL. And the only thing you can do with that is pump messages into that one Zakar queue. Um, and then we have the message syncs. So the main one we want to talk about here today is Mistral. Uh, and that's what we've implemented in Newton is, is the Mistral message sync. Um, so basically, these messages coming out of the Zgar queue can trigger a workflow in Mistral to start. Um, so that, that's how it also solves our authorization problem. Uh, because you can, you can only pump messages into one Zgar queue if you've got the pre-signed URL for that queue. Uh, and the only thing that can happen as a result of that is running that one workflow. So it actually gives you an extremely fine-grained way of, uh, of, of locking down the permissions to running that exact workflow. So that's, that's basically the system. Um, I'll let you guys, these guys give you some, uh, some more details, but... Uh, Basically, Mistral can call any API in OpenStack. Um, and so this, um, this whole kind of loop here uh, gives you an extremely flexible way of, of uh, taking actions based on events uh, in the cloud. Um, so if you, you know, we're, we're demonstrating self-healing today. Um, you can totally get self-healing if your application's running on Kubernetes. Um, that's fine. Like if, if that fits your use case, you should probably you know, buy OpenShift or whatever. Um, but it's not very flexible. It's uh, platform as a service gives you, um, you, know, you do it our way and you like it. Uh, infrastructure as a service is extremely flexible. You can, you can do just about anything in here. So lastly, before I hand over to these guys, I just want to say, that it's, we're turning it over to you all, right? It, it's really up to you. We will get the OpenStack that we deserve. It's an open source project. Um, so 
please uh, go out there, try this out, um, try the demo out, um, figure out what, what your own application needs, um, start putting together your own workflows, your own, um, your own message um, kind of setups, and uh, try it out, use it, uh, be vocal in the community, say, you know, this is, this is what we want OpenStack to be. We want it to be a real cloud, not just a VPS hosting service. Um, if you buy from a distributor, uh, call them up and say, um, you know, please put more resources into this. Uh, especially if you buy from Red Hat, uh, call them up, say, I saw Zanby's talk, why aren't you giving him more time to work on this? Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you don't buy from a distributor, one will call you. Um, so yeah, just um, the, the, there are people in the community who who don't think who think this is a distraction, and I don't think it is. And and it's really up to uh, people who are developing applications on OpenStack, the users of OpenStack, to say, hey, yeah, this is this is something we need. Uh, we want we want to see more of this. So. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to turn over to Fogelong, who's going to tell you a bit about Aid and Zika. Okay. Uh, next, I'm going to introduce a little bit about Aid, and somebody call it old, out her A O D H, whatever. And I want to be surprised, you know, if there is uh, another pronunciation about it. Uh, it is an OpenStack alarming service, and it's slipped out from Selometer. Uh, so I list some eight features, but you know, this is not all the features of eight. I just list some features related to this topic. So eight can support event alarm and threshold alarm, and in in this topic. For our case, we only uh, care about the event alarm. So we can, so when Selometer collects the event from you know, the other stories and forward it to eight, and then we can, I mean, Zucker can get that, uh, that event. So about, uh, about one or two cycles ago, um, I was asked to review a patch in eight, that is a Zucker driver. It looks very interesting because you can, with that case, you can, you can get the event notification collected by Selometer and forward it to, to Zucker. I say I'm excited because you know for for the old way. Selometer can, can collect all the notifications, but those notifications can't be consumed by the end user. When I say end user, I mean the, the tenant user. So yeah, I, I, I have heard about, for example, um, another service like Searchlight also doing this, the similar thing to collect um, you know, the notifications from, from the Rubik RubyMQ message bus and then forward it to Docker. So it's a, it's a really good feature, and that's one of the main part of this uh, of this demo. And then what is Docker? So I I talked with Zen about you know when we try to propose this idea, because just because I. I don't want to propose another Docker introduction topic in OpenStack Summit. We have talked about you know, those kind of topic a lot. So we like to do some, some real things, some interesting things. Anyway, so I, I would like to give a very short introduction about Docker. Docker is a multi-tenant cloud messaging service for web and uh, mobile development. You can, you can imagine the, you know, the same service in AWS is SQS and SNS, the queue service and notification service. So the features of, uh, of Docker, 
currently, Docker can support um, messaging service, and you can call it queue service, whatever, or end notification service. For, for the messaging service, it's like uh, pops up and uh, producer, consumer, the, the traditional way. And notification service, you can create some uh, subscriptions on a queue. So when there is a message posted in the queue, the subscriber will be notified automatically. And currently, we support uh, the databases. From, we have two layer. Uh, sorry. We have two layer uh, layers of database. One is a management database, and one is a, the message database. For message database, we support MongoDB and Redis. For management database, we support Mongo and uh, SQL Alchemy. So for transport layer, we, we also have a transport layer. Transport layer, we support Whiskey, that's the, you know, the traditional HTTP way, and WebSocket. And for notification driver, currently we support uh, email. So for example, when you post a message in the queue, if you create a subscriptions on the queue based on an email address, then the message will be forward, you know, sent to the, the email address. And we also support webhook, for sure. And the, the trust driver, that's my favorite driver. I did by uh, Tom's. So the trust driver is the, you know, the case known, the, the key part of, uh, of this demo. Yeah, so now I will pass away to this. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Uh, so just to provide a little bit more details on, uh, to that big picture that Zane described, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Mistral. And um, so essentially, what, what is Mistral? So Mistral is a, a workflow uh, service, workflow engine, or in other words, we can call it like process automation and state management tool. And uh, I can uh, say a couple of words a little bit later why um, I choose, chose actually uh, this name state management tool. So uh, Mistral is also a language to design uh, distributed processes, uh, in fact. So uh, they, we call them workflows. Actually, workflow is kind of a general term, but, but, term, but um, in our case, we uh, uh, call workflows essentially distribute, some distributed processes that involve uh, a lot of things um, in a distributed environment, actually, a lot of calls. So, and it's also an OpenStack service, of course, uh, with uh, REST API, and it's scalable. Uh, we can scale it uh, almost like linearly. And what's important in the context of this demo, um, Mistral helps wiring uh, OpenStack services together, uh, so it works uh, sort of like a glue. And uh, this is something uh, I will tell a, bit, a little bit about later. So, um, like, what does Mistral do, essentially? So uh, it allows you basically to uh, describe a workflow template, uh, workflow file, and you can upload this uh, workflow template into uh, Mistral, uh, into the service. And essentially, you can start this workflow manually, or in our case, it started based on some um, event uh, happening in the cloud so somewhere. And uh, when it's running, it allows you to track the process, uh, the progress of this process, actually, so that you can see uh, what's already completed, uh, what's not, what is still running. So uh, that's why um, I chose that name, uh, state management tool, because state is like a really important concept here, because it's persistent, allows you to do all kind of monitoring, like uh, manual intervention, human intervention. Actually, if something failed, you can. Uh, actually go fix the problem and start from the same point. So that's why I think state is so important here. And eventually when the workflow completes, you can extract the workflow result through the API. And um, you can also navigate through execution history so that you know exactly what was happening before. Uh, just a couple of words uh, about uh, Mistral language. So it's actually pretty simple, like a couple of hours to, to learn. I believe so, at least. I'm biased a little bit, but uh, I really believe that. So, and uh, it's YAML-based because we all love YAML in OpenStack. And um, 
So what it allows you to do is it allows you to design workflows or distributed processes essentially uh, consistent of tasks. So task is like a key, like a uh, basic element that you can build your workflows out of. And you can define transitions between tasks. So essentially what you do here is you can represent your distributed process, distributed scenario uh, as a graph essentially. And when it's running, um, the workflow engine actually makes decisions about what should be running next and that actually uh, shapes the path in the graph how the workflow is proceeding. And um, tasks are associated with actions. So um, Mistral goes with a lot of actions. Uh, like Zen mentioned, uh, uh, Mistral can actually call any uh, OpenStack services. And this is provided as, uh, in the form of actions. So, and when it comes to uh, wiring multiple OpenStack services, it's, a, it's essentially um, the interesting point. Uh, so, uh, we can flexibly define what should be done on a certain event uh, that just happened in the cloud. Um, so, and basically, you can build a scenario how to heal your application, how to auto scale it, do something else, and it's extremely flexible. You can have a set of workflows for like any kind of situations, essentially. And when you design this workflow, at some certain steps of this workflow, actually, Mistral can call OpenStack. That's uh, how it uh, helps wiring it. So, more specifically, um, Mistral provides you with uh, all the actions. Uh, so you can build this kind of graph describing this process. And it combines all these like, service calls into one distributed process. And what's important here, it's um, actually, uh, it helps with uh, passing data, data between uh, the services. So for example, you called one service, and you need that the output of the service to be the input of the next service. So, um, and in order to do it reliably, uh, Mistral is a really uh, helpful tool here. And, it's, uh, it also helps pass in security context, but uh, like Zen said, um, it's kind of a work in progress thing in many, in many ways, but uh, it helps anyway. So basically it like determines, uh, defines the context uh, of this whole scenario, of this whole distributed process uh, involving like multiple um, OpenStack calls. Yeah, and uh, like I said before, it's uh, also important that uh, Mistral allows to do uh, to make this scenario like state, stateful and suitable for monitoring. So you can uh, see this persistent state by like connecting it uh, to it from like any tools uh, like CLI something else. Um, and that's basically it. That's. Yeah. Can we go to the uh, demo? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, so before we. Show the crazy demo. Let me uh, <laughs> give a little bit introduction about how it works. Uh, then he'll give a, a very good graph about how it works. But basically, uh, this is the pre-steps how to set up the the application. Actually, so firstly, we need to create a stack in heat. The stack actually the stack is your application. For example, in auto scaling. Uh, also scaling uh, instance, and create a workflow in Mistral based on the stack information. For example, the, the instance ID, the stack ID, root stack ID, and then create a pre-signed queue in Docker so that you can get a, you know, a pre-signed queue and create an, uh, the alarm in, uh, in aid. And before that, we also need to create a subscription in Docker based on the workflow we just created. So that when there is a, a notification in Celometer, Celometer will notify um, aid and aid forward, uh, forward the message to Docker and Docker notify uh, Mistral to execute the workflow. So yeah, and the last step is create an alarm in eight based on the present queue information. So you, you don't have to worry about the, you know, the authentication issue. 
and precise. Yeah, I, I just mentioned how it works. So, defend it. Like to Okay. So firstly, I will, yeah, <laughs> initialize the environment, just clean some uh, old results I just created. A new that error is just because um, I'm using a Docker for heat to to listen the you know the heat stack create change status instead of just pulling uh, heat again and again to check if the st stack has been created completely. Okay, the first step uh, is create the, the stack in heat. Come on. Okay. Uh, so now the stack has been created successfully, and we are going to the next step. So the next step is Create the creating the the workflow in Mistral just based on the information we just got from the stack. We need uh, the instance ID and the stack ID. So you know, and later we can we can mark the instance as unhealthy and call hit uh, stack update to update the, the entire stack. And then we create uh, a present queue in Docker. You will see the, the information, the present queue information. Um, we just create subscription. You can see the first subscription is based on uh, the, the, the workflow ID of Mistral. So that, you know, when there is a an notification an alarm from aid to Docker. Docker will create the, the execution in Mistral. And we also create a, a subscription based on an email, so that you know, when there is an alarm, you will be notified based on the email. OK, so we just create all the stuff we need. The last step, we just create a, an alarm in aid that's not finished. So now let's uh, 
take a look at the instance. We just create two instances. It's an outscaling group, so there are two instances and that group. And for now, uh, we can try to pin the four. Okay, it works. And we try to pin toy. Okay, it works. So now I'm going to stop one instance. I know the, the NOAA stop status is not a perfect status you can trust to, you know, to do the auto healing, but I think it's good enough you know, to show the idea. Okay, so we can take a look at the NOAA status. So what we are expecting is there should be a new instance create, and the old one will be, um, yeah, just leave it at the status. No, come on. Come on. The live demo got strike again. Hmm. Actually, that's one of the the issue I I see when I you know to prepare the whole demo. The the event of um, of accelerometer to eight is not really really stable. I would say. Try shutting down the other one, let's see. Okay. I guess revise. It's not really easy to I just tried it before, before the session, but I don't know why. Try shutting down the other instance okay. to see if that one works. I will try the other one to see if it works. Sorry? Okay, I, for now I'm going to restart the, the cellometer agent notification to see if the notification can be forward. Oh, uh, we're, we're almost out of time. Do you want to play the video? That oh, yeah, maybe we can, we can. Yeah, actually, in the meantime, maybe we could take some questions. Yeah, anyone yeah. has questions, so.
Happy to answer. Yeah. I have a question about uh, setting up the resources uh, Excellent question. So the question was, can we use the heat stack to create all the stuff that we see in the script here? Um, we're still missing one short, resource. Yeah, short answer is no. We're missing like two uh, resource types we need in heat. Uh, one is, um, so we can create aid alarms in heat, but not the aid event alarms. Um, yeah. So I've raised a bug for that. We will, we will get that implemented in Okada. Uh, the other thing is there's no way to create a pre-signed uh, Zakar queue in heat at the moment. Um, again, raise a bug. We'll fix that in Okada. Um, so I, I would expect in the next couple of months we'll be able to um, put this whole thing in a single heat template um, and, and you can define your whole application in one heat template and say, bam, there we go, self-healing um, application in one template. Yeah. Yes? Uh, yes, yes, it can. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah actually, you, you can. Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah. it can be, uh, well, the, the only integration point actually with OpenStack is uh, uh, OpenStack Actions available uh, in uh, the workflow language. And they are available only if you authenticate against Keystone. But uh, if you disable it, it's fine to use it anywhere else. So actually, most of our like, real uh, big use cases uh, right now uh, have nothing, almost have nothing to do with op OpenStack. <laughs> Yeah, so you're, we're detecting uh, the VM stops or fails or whatever, and, and what you're detecting, you can change it depending on what events you set up alarms on. Yes, so, you're, uh, so if you want your application to be the one detecting failures instead of um, Solometer and Aid, uh, you, can, you can post messages to the Zakaku directly uh, from your application, or you can post, uh, your application can post uh, statistics into Solometer and you can have alarms coming out based on that. Um, as I said before, it's, it's very, very flexible. Um, but yes, if you've got you know, Nagos monitoring your thing, you can have that post messages to the car. Um, pretty much anything you can think of, um, yeah, you can set it up. OK, I, I have put uh, uh, the script I'm using on GitHub so you can uh, grab the link to take a look. It has the whole flow. But yeah, as Tim mentioned, after we create the, those Result, missing results in heat, we can basically create you know all of the things in one heat template and yeah all done. So I guess we ran out of time. I don't, uh, I don't believe there's anything special you need to enable. Um, I know there's a couple I think, of I think bugs that we fixed that may not be in stable Newton yet. The only, thing, the only thing you may need to enable is um, enable the event, event alarm in, uh, in cellometers configuring file. That's the only ah, thing right. I yeah. change. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.